Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair, and Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay, bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, written by Al Lewis. Well, the nation's schools threw open their doors last Monday, and in spite of a difficult first week, our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, was determined not to let the rigors of the impending semester dim her enthusiasm for her chosen career. Well, she was talking about it early Friday morning in the room she rents from Mrs. Davis. Sure, it's difficult being a teacher, but lots of other occupations are difficult, too. Besides, maybe Mr. Conklin, our principal, will recommend that I be made head of the English department. That carries a bigger salary with it, and who knows, from there I might become an assistant principal. Maybe even a principal. Then there's always Mr. Boynton. He's been pretty shy for a biology teacher, but I'm sure he'll warm up a little this term. I bet he'll just insist on spending more and more time with me on weekends as well as school days. Why, this year he might even propose. Huh? Huh? Uh-huh. Oh. oh, okay. Okay. Darned alarm clock. I wish you'd waited for another minute. I was about to discover oil in my inkwell. <laughs> Connie? Oh, Connie, it's time to get up. Oh, I am up, Mrs. Davis. Come on in. I was afraid you wouldn't hear your alarm, Connie. Now I'll get breakfast started and... Oh, before I forget, Mr. Conklin called while you were still asleep. He said to tell you to stop at his office before you go to your first class. That's what we all need, something to look forward to. It's probably about his new cheerleading idea. Cheerleading idea? Yes, he doesn't think there's enough enthusiasm for our football team. Tomorrow's the first game, and he wants the team to feel that we're all behind them. I see. How did the Madison team wind up last year, Connie? They had an undefeated season, Mrs. Davis. They did? That's right. They didn't defeat a single team. (laughs) That's why Mr. Conklin's got this wild scheme to make a member of the faculty act as cheerleader. A member of the faculty leading cheers? Exactly. He doesn't feel that the student yell leaders are generating enough steam. (laughs) But whom do you think he'll select for the job, Connie? Well, it's a lot of hard work with no extra pay... I seem like a natural for it. (laughs) Oh, but, Connie, why should Mr. Conklin pick you for a job like that? Because Mr. Conklin is one of my most ardent boosters. He's right behind me every minute. (laughs) It gives me a great sense of security to know that our beloved principal is one of my staunchest supporters. Really? Yes, it's like standing on a nice, firm gallows. (laughs) But after what he's already done to me, leading a few cheers will be easy. He's done something else? Yes, he's still on his big anti-fraternization kick. So he moved me from room 148, right next to Mr. Boynton's biology lab, way down to room 102. I hardly get to see him at all now. But can't you just stroll casually down to his room between classes? There isn't much time between classes, Mrs. Davis. How casual can you be with spiked shoes and a kneeling start? (laughs) Poor Connie. If it isn't one thing, it's another. But I still can't conceive of you as a cheerleader in a football stadium. I assure you, Mr. Conklin can. I wouldn't be surprised if he, he expected me to be a drum majorette as well. Why, this very minute, he's probably chuckling into his coffee at the thought of me throwing a big brass baton up in the air and catching it without a bounce on the top of my head. Now, this coffee is very good, Harriet. (laughs) Yeah, I can just see her now. Catching that big stick right on top of her head. (laughs) Pardon me, Daddy, but I don't quite follow you. Oh, oh, it's Miss Brooks, Harriet. I'm thinking of making her faculty cheerleader for the football season. Why, that's a wonderful idea, Daddy. The kids are crazy about Miss Brooks. Yes, the kids are crazy. (laughs) But, Harriet, do you think she'll accept her new assignment as yell leader cheerfully? I don't know why not. If it's good enough for a principal, it ought to be all right for a teacher. What do you mean, if it's good enough for a principal? 
of the stories right here in the morning paper, Daddy. Jason Brill, principal of Clay City High School, elected honorary cheerleader. But it was my idea to get a faculty cheerleader. I told Brill about it last week when we... Let's see that paper. Why, they've got his picture in here. Jason Brill thanking the student body of Clay City High... Well, of all the hammy oafs. Not only does he steal my idea, but he appoints himself to grab all the publicity. But he didn't appoint himself, Daddy. He was elected by the students. Oh, he was elected by the students. <laughs> well, then I guess I can be elected by the students as well. You? A cheerleader? <laughs> well, what's so funny about it? I was a drum major in college. I'll call a special assembly right after lunch and we'll vote for a faculty cheerleader. Well, gosh, Daddy, I don't like to undermine your ego, but if it's an elective position, Miss Brooks will probably win it by a mile. Oh, she will. You forget, young lady, that your father is an old hand at politics. Why, I was offered a political position before I was even a teacher in this town. Yes, Daddy. Of course, I had a good reason for not accepting. I know. The back of your car wasn't big enough to hold all the dogs you'd have to collect. Uh, that... <laughs> Not the position. I wish your mother would stop blabbing that story around. <laughs> now, uh, clear off the dishes and let's get to school. Okay, Daddy. Maybe I'll get a chance to rub noses with my dream pie before school starts. He's driving Miss Brooks down this morning. Your dream pie? Walter Denton. No. <laughs> Please, Harriet. Not at the breakfast table. <laughs> So, Miss Brooks, although I've often kidded about the subject, his actions this week forced me reluctantly to one conclusion. What's that, Walter? Mr. Conklin finds me acutely distasteful. That's why he put me, my best pal, Stretch Snodgrass, and my best girl, Harriet Conklin, all in different classes. I just don't see how a man can be so cruel to his own flesh and blood. Harriet? Certainly. Why do you realize what he's denying, that poor girl? Me! <laughs> You'll just have to be brave, I guess. And look what he did to you. Moved you all the way down to room 102. Now, that's about as far away as you can get from Mr. Boynton's lab. Why, it must be 200 yards. 204 and 9 inches. <laughs> Maybe absence will make the heart grow fonder. He did ask me out last Wednesday night. Mr. Boynton asked you for a date in the middle of the week? He certainly did. Invited me to a drive-in movie in his neighborhood. Well, that sounds cozy. It could have been cozier. He felt it would keep him up too late if he drove me home, so he suggested that I bring my car along, too. <laughs> oh, gee, once you got into the place, you snuggled up real close, didn't you? It's a little difficult, Walter, to snuggle up to somebody with a new Hudson in between. <laughs> Let's get back to your problem, Walter. I'm sorry to hear you're not happy in your present classes. I'm miserable, Miss Brooks. You see, it isn't just being separated from Harriet that hurts. It's Stretch Snodgrass, too. You know how close Stretch and I are. After all, you taught the both of us English last term. You were both in my class last term, if that's what you mean. <laughs> your friend Stretch is the only pupil I've ever met who garnered, out of a possible 100%, a final mark of nine. <laughs> Even your sparkling 27 looked good by comparison. Well, he may not be overburdened with brains, but he's got a great sense of loyalty, Miss Brooks. Gosh, if we're kept apart all term, it'll break Stretch's heart. And mine, too. Maybe you can get us transferred back to your class. Please, Miss Brooks, please. You've got to help us. Tell me you'll help us. Now, take it easy, Walter. You can rest assured I'll do everything in my power to arrange a transfer for you. Gee, thanks, Miss Brooks. After all, I want you, as well as Stretch, to look back upon your career at Madison High School as the happiest 12 years of your life. <laughs> Starring Eve Arden will continue in just a moment, but first, here is Vern Smith. Now, dental science reveals a startling discovery in the fight against tooth decay. Proof that always using Colgate Dental Cream right after eating 
help stop tooth decay before it starts. Continuous research, hundreds of case histories, makes this the most important news in dental history. Eminent dental authorities supervised hundreds of college men and women for over a year. One group always brushed their teeth with Colgate's right after eating. The other followed their usual dental care. And here are the amazing results. The group using Colgate Dental Cream, as directed, showed a startling reduction in average number of cavities, far less tooth decay. The other group developed new cavities at a much higher rate. No other dentifrice offers proof of these results. And Colgate's contains all the necessary ingredients, including an exclusive patented ingredient for effective daily dental care. No risk of irritation to tissues and gums. And no change in flavor, foam, or cleansing action. As always, Colgate's cleans your breath while it cleans your teeth. The Colgate's now at your dealers is the same formula used in the test. Always use Colgate Dental Cream right after eating to help prevent new cavities, help stop tooth decay before it starts. Well, I arrived in school before Mr. Conklin did, and having a little time to kill, I sauntered toward Mr. Boynton's biology laboratory. Morning, Mr. Boynton. Just happened to be in the neighborhood, so I thought I'd race in, uh, drop in. Well, sit down, catch your breath. Yeah, I, thanks. I was just feeding my pet frog. You remember McDougal. Oh, of course. Hi, Mac. <laughs> we haven't seen very much of you since Mr. Conklin changed your room. I know. Do you miss me? <laughs> One down. And one to go. <laughs> How about you, Mr. Boynton? Do you miss me? Well, gosh, I... If you're bashful, just say, mm. <laughs> Wait, it's only natural, I suppose, for all living creatures who form a certain habit pattern to be temporarily thrown into a mild state of confusion by the disruption of that pattern. <laughs> that is to say, any warm blooded mammal who has formed some sort of an attachment for another warm blooded mammal <laughs> would become quite lonesome if that warm blooded mammal were to be removed. Let's stand closer to the bars. Here come some people with peanuts. <laughs> What I'm trying to say, I suppose, is that both Mac and myself have missed you a little between class visits. Mm. <laughs> and by the same token, I, I suppose it's logical to assume you've missed seeing us. You can say that again. <laughs> Thanks, Max. <laughs> I'll, I'll put him back in his cage now. Here you go, boy. You've had plenty of exercise for one morning. There we are. See you later, Mac. <laughs> Well, Miss Brooks, what do you think the coming term's going to be like? If Mr. Conklin keeps on like he started, it should be a dilly. Did you know that he took Stretch Snodgrass, Walter Denton, and his daughter Harriet out of my room and put them each in a different English class? Oh, yes, I know. Harriet's in Miss Enright's class now. She's got your old room right next door. Too bad about the kids. But... Miss Enright has the room next door? Yes, she drops in quite often to say hello to Mac. To Mac, huh? <laughs> yes. Always said she's been interested in frog life. Frog life, huh? <laughs> she and Mac are, are crazy about each other. Believe me, they're mated. <laughs> Miss Enright's quite fond of you, Miss Brooks. In fact, just the other day she was telling me how, how sorry she was that you had to work here in summer school while she was getting brown as a berry on a vacation. She paid you quite a nice compliment, too. That I'd like to hear. All right. She said that you were the only person she knew who could look so alive without any vestige of color in her face. <laughs> oh, that kid has got to go. I had no idea when I was given room 102 that she was going... Oh, it's Miss Enright. Of course, you know Miss Brooks. Oh, certainly. Hello, dear Miss Brooks. Hi. <laughs> you seem to have a little more color than usual. What happened? Cut yourself? <laughs> now, just a minute, Miss Enright. And Enright's. your hair looks simply lovely this morning. Did you make it yourself? <laughs> Everything but the bun in the back. I had that done in the hamburger stand on the corner. <laughs> 
I'd ask you to sit down, Miss Enright, but there aren't any chairs between these lab tables. Oh, Miss Enright doesn't need a chair. Come sit over here by me, dear. I'll light up this Bunsen burner for you. <laughs> Of course, if you were just leaving, anyhow, oh, I don't no, want to... not just yet, Miss Brooks. Uh, Mr. Boynton, I dropped in to give you a little present. Oh? Something you can wear at the football game tomorrow. Here, let me take it out of the box. <laughs> there. Oh, gosh, an orange-colored turtleneck sweater. Isn't it divine? Looks like a hot water bottle with sleeves. <laughs> Oh, it's beautiful, and it was very nice of you to knit it for me, Miss Enright. Oh, I didn't knit it, Mr. Boynton. This is part of a match set I bought at Sherry's department store. I, uh, I have one exactly like it for myself. Oh, if you bought it, Miss Enright, I'm afraid I won't be able to accept it. It's against my principles to take anything I don't pay for. Oh, please, Mr. Boynton, just consider it a premature Christmas present. Well, in that case, thank you, Miss Enright. I'd better hang it up in the cloakroom so it doesn't get creased. Will you excuse me, Miss Brooks? Certainly. I'll stay here and chat with Santa. I'll just a moment. Well, Miss Brooks, I hear you may be our new faculty cheerleader. And I'd like to tell you I think it's a remarkable achievement. What's so remarkable about it? Well, the fact that you dare to indulge in such strenuous pursuits at your age. I mean, is cheerleading really quite safe for you, darling? Don't worry about me, Miss Enright. If Rudy Valley can still lift a megaphone, I can. <laughs> but I must say that sweater you gave Mr. Boynton was a very nice method of vacuuming an invitation to the game out of him. Oh, you make it sound like a plot, darling. Don't you know that I never indulge in intrigue? Subterfuge is for those who need it. No, my dear. My hands are clean. They should be, considering all the time you must spend licking your paws. <laughs> are you hinting that I... Oh, I'm not hinting anything, Miss Enright. I just understand why you didn't knit that sweater yourself. You would have wasted too much time playing with a ball of yarn. <laughs> Roll thing, you. Sometimes I think you're out of this world... But I know it's just wishful thinking. <laughs> Likewise, I'm sure. But you'll have to excuse me now. I've got to stop in at Mr. Conklin's office before class. Well, I'll have to dash, too, I'm afraid. I'll... Oh, I'm sorry I kept you la waiting, ladies. Oh, are you leaving? Yes, I'd better get an early start. It's a sleeper jump to my room from here. <laughs> well, I'm glad you dropped in, and thanks a million for that dandy sweater, Miss Enright. Oh, you're very welcome, Mr. Boynton. Goodbye. Bye. Don't be strange. It's out of her hands. <laughs> so you see, Mr. Conklin, Harriet, Walter, and Stretch would like to be transferred to the same English class. But why, Miss Brooks? Because they've all been together for several terms now, and the kids miss each other. You see, they're friends, and friendship is a very important thing to young people. Why? Because it is. They derive a certain... Look, Mr. Conklin, have you ever had a friend? A good question, Miss Brooks. <laughs> and much as it may surprise you, the answer is in the affirmative. When I was a rather small boy, I was quite friendly with my mother. <laughs> now then, I'd like to change the subject. But, Mr. Conklin, Miss it's a very... I see no reason whatsoever for transferring my daughter Harriet into the same class with a dunce like Walter Denton. But what about Stretch Snodgrass? Uh, that's different. Now you're talking about the mind of the century. <laughs> I mean, supposing you put Walter and Stretch together. What, and create a half-wit? <laughs> now, before you return to your class, Miss Brooks, there's another matter I'd like to broach to you. Uh, did you read the paper this morning? No, sir, I didn't. I see. Then do you mind receiving some of the news in capsule form? Why should I mind? That's how I get my salary. I mean... <laughs> What news, Mr. Conklin? Well, it seems that Jason Brill got himself elected faculty cheerleader at the Clay City High. But I thought that was... Yes, a... yes, Miss Brooks, it was my idea, but he latched onto it. Uh, pilfered it from me last week. <laughs> now, you know how I feel about Jason Brill, don't you? I think so, Mr. Conklin. To you, he's a sort of an old Walter Denton. Worse, if possible. 
However, he's not going to get away with this, Miss Brooks. We're going to hold an election here at Madison this afternoon, and I'm going to win it. I guess I'll rate as much newspaper space as that old Billy Goat any day. Pardon me, Mr. Conklin, but who's going to vote in this election? Why, the undergraduate body, of course. I see. Well, then the outcome may not be as easy to foretell as you think. You see, Mr. Conklin, whereas on the one hand, the students love, admire, and respect you... Yes? Now, what did I do with that other hand? (laughs) I am well aware of the mercurial nature of the student body's likes and dislikes, Miss Brooks. However, if I were nominated by someone in whom they have always had faith, someone who could swing all her votes my way, I'd be assured of victory. Someone like who? It's whom, Miss Brooks. You don't have to tell me whom, it's meme. (laughs) But, Mr. Conklin, if I'm nominated in good faith, would it be ethical to nominate you? This is politics, Miss Brooks. There's always room for compromise. If you agree to nominate me, for example, I might see things your way on one of your pet projects. Specifically, those transfers you were concerned about a minute ago. You mean you'd transfer the kids back to my class? Now we're interested, aren't we? (laughs) Of course, if I did add those pupils to your class, I'd have to move you to a larger room, say back to 148, next to the biology lab. (laughs) Well, what are you thinking, Miss Brooks? Just that when you became a principal, Madison's gain was Tammany's loss. (laughs) Then you'll do it. Fine. Now, I think it best that you keep the entire matter a secret until you actually place my name in nomination at the assembly this afternoon. That way, coming just before the voting, the impact will be the greatest. I'll have the nominating speech all ready for you by lunchtime. Let's see now, have I overlooked anything? Just the getaway car with the motor running. Please, quiet, quiet. And now we shall have a few words from your latest nominee, a woman whose opinions we all value so highly, our Miss Brooks. Now remember, my dear, read the speech I gave you in a nice, clear voice and make the finish as impressive as possible. I will, Mr. Conklin. I may hang myself. (laughs) Students of Madison High, it is indeed a rare occurrence when one candidate nominates another. It is only when a man has such stature that he towers above all competition that one is forced to do so. Moved to do so. Moved to do so. (laughs) Here at Madison, we have such a candidate, a man whose unquestioned spirit is only equaled by his qualities of leadership. He has enthusiasm. Get up and go. And I wish I could. That is, this candidate has long guided the destiny of this glorious institution of which I am proud to be an inmate. Instructor. Uh, instructor. Therefore, may I place in nomination and urge you all to vote for the man whose kindness, consideration, and unselfishness is known to us all. Osgood Conklin? I mean, uh, Osgood Conklin. <laughs> Osgood Conklin? Osgood Conklin. Thank you, Harriet. (laughs) Now we shall proceed to that which is the inherent right and treasured privilege of every American, the vote. In order to speed things along, I have decided that we can dispense with the antiquated written ballot. Instead, each student will simply file up to the platform and tell me who he's voting for. First row, please. I object! Down, Denton. I'm afraid I second the objection, sir. The sanctity of the secret ballot is something... Please, Mr. Boynton. Mr. Conklin has a motive in wanting to expedite matters. He's merely trying to railroad himself through. Uh, Get the voting. (laughs) Get the voting accomplished quickly. Seems to be something wrong, Miss Brooks. Remember, I won't keep my promise unless you keep yours. Well, I'm trying to, Mr. Conklin. Students, uh, students, listen to me, please. I move that we elect Mr. Uh, Mr. Conklin faculty cheerleader by acclamation. Now, what do you say, kids? Is it Osgood Conklin by acclamation? Ah! 
<laughs> Motion carried. Congratulations, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Brooks. Students, you may rest assured that this overwhelming vote of confidence is not misplaced. It may interest you to know that your new faculty cheerleader once threw a brass baton 50 feet into the air and caught it with one hand. Unfortunately, we have no such baton on the premises, or I'd be Here's glad... Here's one right over here by the bandstand. <laughs> Quiet, Denton. Hand that up here, Walter. Here you are, Mr. Conklin. A real drum major's baton. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Daddy. Throw it up in the air the way you used to. Looks like you're on, Mr. Conklin. Oh, yeah. Well, let's see here. We twirl her around like this. Oh, huh, I remember now. Then up she goes. Oh, that's a pretty good toss, if I say so myself. But I've lost sight of it. Where did the confounded thing disappear? <laughs> All together now, gang, a skyrocket, two locomotives, and a band-aid for Mr. Conklin. Steve Arden is our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, yes, tonight... Show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a Luster Cream shampoo. Luster Cream, world's finest shampoo. No other shampoo in the world gives K. Dumas magic blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Not a soap, not a liquid. Luster Cream shampoo leaves hair three ways lovelier. Fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable, even in hardest water, Luster Cream lathers instantly. No special rinse needed after a Luster Cream shampoo. So gentle, Luster Cream is wonderful even for children's hair. Tonight, yes, tonight, try Luster Cream shampoo. Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a luster cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, I left the auditorium after a spirited rally, during which we all sang songs and cheered while Mr. Conklin rubbed his head. At the end of the school day, I ran into Mr. Boynton as he was coming out of our principal's office. And from what he told me, I knew Mr. Conklin had kept his end of the bargain. Yes, indeed. There certainly has been a lot of switching around, Miss Brooks. Miss Enright's been moved into room 101. That's probably so I could have my old room back. You know, 148 next to your biology lab. My old biology lab. Old biology lab? You mean you've got a new one? Yep. In the switching around, I've been moved to 102 next to Miss Enright. Oh, no. <laughs> well, let's not waste any more time in school, Miss Brooks. After all, today's Friday. We have a date to go to the zoo. Let's skip it, Mr. Boynton. With my luck, they're sure to put us in separate cages. <laughs> Next week, tune into another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair and Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. <laughs> Doctors prove you, too, may have a lovelier complexion in 14 days. Yes, 36 leading skin specialists proved in tests on 1,285 different women that a new method of cleansing with palm olive soap using nothing but palm olive brought new complexion beauty to two women out of three. Just wash your face three times daily with palm olive soap. Each time for 60 seconds, massaging palm olive's beauty lather onto your skin. Then rinse. So start your palm olive facials today. See what palm olive soap can do for your complexion in just 14 days. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. Smart Tuesday evening over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.